Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. It's good to see you all this morning. It's really good for me to be back. I um, have not been with you all for three weeks, and um, I've missed you a lot. Although I have been with you um, online each week and uh, and live streaming, and I've enjoyed um, I've enjoyed being parts of, of that time of worship, and um, it's it's been uh, it's been good. Um, it's especially exciting to be able to to be back with you in person this morning. I want to welcome uh, anybody who might be visiting with us this morning. We are glad that you are here. If you are visiting and would like to reach, uh, to have the church reach out to you, do know that a portion of uh, the bulletin does tear out and you can leave your contact information there. Additionally, if you're uh, joining us online, you can go to firstbaptistfarmville.org and find our contact information uh, there. But we would love to, uh, to see how we might be able to minister to you and to your family. Um, also, I want to say a big uh, welcome to those who are joining us online. I know uh, still being in the summertime with vacations and such, uh, that several are uh, joining us uh, on that platform. And if you are doing that, um, I want to encourage you to say hello in the comment section to get a sense of the community gathered online. This morning, for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so by placing them in the offering plates on either side of the stage. And also, there's one uh, located in the vestibule. Uh, there are a few announcements that I want to give this morning. One is to say a big thank you to those um, of you who have taken the time to sign up on our sign-up sheet over here for Wednesday night suppers. Uh, we're going to continue having that out there uh, just to, to try to get a sense of the numbers over the next couple of weeks. Um, and there will also be a called meeting for those um, who have served in the past on the kitchen um, committees as we begin the, or during the month of August make some plans we're beginning in September, but the numbers look exciting and look good, and hopefully that's how things will be uh, when we start in September, and uh, I'm excited about Wednesday evening activities beginning, and, and that's going to be the first Wednesday after uh, Labor Day. I believe that is the 7th. Um, there are, uh, is a new Bible study opportunity that is happening uh, this coming Tuesday, August 9th at 9.30 a.m. at Frankie Moy's home, and all are welcome to that. Um, I believe that uh, it may have been um, at some point maybe put out that it was only for women, but this is for women and men. So if you're available and, and are looking for a midweek Bible study option in the morning at 9.30 a.m., it's a great opportunity at Frankie Moy's home. And she's here this morning, so if you have any questions, you can go and, and uh, ask her about that. You also see in our bulletin that there is a blood community blood drive happening at Farmville Presbyterian Church, and that is um, next Sunday, August 14th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Again, that's at Farmville Presbyterian Church. So if you are interested in that, please do reach out to the office over at the Presbyterian Church. And I know that usually they do accept walk-ins um, on those afternoons. Uh, we also have some great news to share this morning. Uh, Willie and Sylvia Allen, as, as well as Ed and Bette Jones, uh, welcome a great-grandchild, a, a, I believe a great-granddaughter uh, to their family. They don't know the name yet. Uh, but we celebrate um, with them, and I, I know that Ed and Bet do join us on online quite a bit. So uh, we celebrate with your family, uh, welcoming a, a new great grandchild, and all the beauty and joy that that brings. Um, as we uh, transition into a time um, continuing to worship and pray, I do want to say a, a word of welcome to Allison Mossy for being here uh, today to lead us, uh, using your talents and gifts uh, as you lead us in worship. So thank you. At this time, I enjoy, uh, invite you to join your hearts in prayer with me. Holy God, we thank you for uh, this day and this time and in these moments that we can experience you. Lord, as we open our lives to you and, and worship you and lay down our burdens and give you ourselves, we pray that we'll find that uh, that is the path um, to being able to, to, to be the people that we're called to be in view of you. We pray that your Holy Spirit uh, would be ever-present in this time of worship, opening our eyes to ways that we can take steps with you in the lives that we're called to, and that we might be the church that you're calling us to be in this community and in the community beyond. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. This time I invite you to grab a, a hymnal if there's one uh, nearby. Uh, if not, the responsive reading uh, will be on the screen, but I ask you to join me in responsive reading number 524. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. God, being rich in mercy, 
because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in, this, in the age to come uh, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by grace we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life and at this time I invite you to stand and sing our hymn of praise to God be the glory hymn number 56 this morning um, and Holly requested that we add her uh, cousin her name is Jamie Asby to our prayer list um, she is uh, undergoing tests uh, for uh, a cancer diagnosis and, and, and such and is trying to figure out um, specifics on, on what lays, lies ahead and so we want to pray for Jamie for peace for clarity for uh, wisdom for uh, doctors and, and people who are working alongside her for um, all the needs uh, that she and her family have, that they'll be met by the Lord. 
Uh, last week, uh, joining online, I like the way that Rick gave us all an opportunity to pick a few people from the prayer list and pray for them ourselves. So uh, before I do the morning prayer, I'd like to give the opportunity uh, for that to happen. So if you would take a moment and, and just pick a few people there on that prayer list and silently lift them up where you're seated. Uh, after a couple of minutes, I will resume and, and continue the morning prayer. Let us pray. God, as we worship you this morning, we acknowledge your closeness always. But it's in times that we hurt, in times of frustration, in times that trials come upon us that we especially need to turn our eyes and fix them upon you. God, as we look at the members of our church and friends who are on our prayer list this morning, God, we acknowledge the great need among this body for healing, for hope, for peace, uh, for, uh, for comfort. Lord, we pray that you would answer the prayers for these people. We pray that you would uh, bring healing where there's a need for healing. We pray that you would bring comfort into, uh, in, into situations that might feel quite chaotic. We pray for family and friends who carry these burdens alongside of these loved ones, that you would give them strength to be great encouragers and supporters. Lord, we pray that you would show us how we are to be your hands and feet, not only in the lives of these people, but in the lives of everyone we meet. Lord, we thank you that your church continues to grow, continues to thrive on this earth, although there is darkness, there is despair, there is brokenness. We recognize that your kingdom still comes into the hearts and lives of people. And that's, that's why we gather, Lord, because we are members of your kingdom. So God, we pray that as we continue to worship you, as we lift up our brothers and sisters to you, that we would see the ways that you answer the prayers for your people. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. This morning our psalm reading comes from Psalm 33, verses 12 through 22. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our hope and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you all stand and join us in singing our song of worship, O Worship the King, song, hymn number 104.
seated. and that was beautiful. I want to say a thanks. I know Rick uh, 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 let you all know he relayed the message last Sunday of my thanks uh, for all of the encouragement and care and, and cards and ways that you all have, uh, have encouraged me over the past few weeks while I've been away and healing from surgery. I really do appreciate it and uh, it's meant a whole, whole lot uh, to me and um, I'm glad, I really am glad to be here and to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, forgive me if I do get a little bit winded. Um, the abdominal muscles took quite a shot from the, from the surgery. I didn't realize how important they were to do everything. Um, so thanks to Gina joining us online, I'm sure, this morning. Don't know if the kids are able to, to join us online, but uh, our, part of our family is a little under the weather uh, this weekend. But uh, thanks to her for helping me put my, shoe, my socks and shoes on this morning. So um, hope my goal for next Sunday is to be able to do that for myself. Um, and usually I've been wearing a girdle, like I, well, it's called a binder, but I just call it my girdle because that's, I mean, let's face it, that's what it is. And it supports me and it helps me, you know, really uh, breathe a whole lot better. But I couldn't fit my pants on this morning. So it was either, it was either no girdle or no pants. So no girdle equals keeping my job. And so, you know, all that all works, 
together for the good. But um, it's it's been it's been an interesting journey for me, um, and, and I expected it going in. Um, it's hard for me to do nothing. It really is hard for me to do nothing. Uh, in fact, our house, uh, Shauna's up there. Our house had some issues. Um, on a Thursday evening, we asked Luke to go and, and potty one more time before bed. And he says, Mommy, Daddy, someone peed everywhere in the bathroom. And we go in there, and there's water everywhere in the bathroom. I'm like, somebody had a, a ginormous bladder to do this, Luke. It, it wasn't somebody. We have an issue with the plumbing. And so, um, and so uh, Shauna and her dad came out. And, and I don't know if you know about this about Shauna, but um, one of the, the she was on the search committee of, that brought, you know, so I met her a few times, but when I really got to know her uh, was when uh, seeing her crawl out from under my house. Um, when we first moved in over here, we had some plumbing issues due to getting some asbestos off of some pipes and stuff. Here she comes crawling out from under the house, so tough as nails. And I think she might have still has some of those pink uh, bob earrings on going. But, um, <laughs> but, but she didn't have these on Friday, but her and her dad showed up, and uh, they... They worked till probably about two in the afternoon, eight thirty to two in the afternoon. They figured out the problem. Um, just you know, I wanted to be out there helping them, so I'm out there supervising, just walking around, holding my stomach in the best I could because I just, and I probably shouldn't uh, in retrospect. I probably should have laid a little bit more uh, low, but it's that's been hard for me. It's been hard for me to, to sit around and allow the healing process to happen, but I know that it's important, so I've tried my best, um, and I, I'll, I'll keep doing trying to do that. But while I've been recovering. Uh, I've held on to a, a nugget of truth that someone told me a, a while back, and um, I, I don't know how many years ago it was, and I can't remember exactly who the person was, but they said when you're sick, your mind doesn't have to be sick. When you're healing from something and your body's going through something, it doesn't mean your mind has to be doing that as well. Quite often when we're physically going through something, we're emotionally going through it as well. And so during this process, I've, I've tried to center my mind and in the right places and in good places. And of course, the Word of God is one of those places. And a good friend of mine brought me a couple of devotion books that have helped along those lines as well. I found myself enjoying the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Gospels. And especially, I love the little letters. And, and uh, I call Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians the little letters, those four little letters. I love them a lot. And um, in Galatians this past week, uh, or excuse me, the week before when I was reading there was a passage in Galatians that really just jumped out to me, and I found myself going and reading it a few, a few times, and that's where this sermon comes from today, holding on to the grace of God. Uh, Galatians was a book that was written by Paul to the Christians uh, that were in the Galatia area, and the main theme that Paul is trying to, to, to write in this letter is trying to answer a question that kept coming up again and again for these Messianic Jews, these, these early converts to Christianity who were going amongst Gentiles and they were spreading uh, this, this word of this, this Messiah, this, this one who actually did what he said he was going to do. He was, he was killed on the cross and then three days later he rose again and he made appearances among people and then he ascended into heaven and 40 days later his Holy Spirit came down on people and now as people are putting their faith in Jesus Christ, not only are they having salvation forever, but their lives are completely changed then and there. They, 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 were, they were literally becoming brand new people and not just people who like had a 12-step plan to recovery from sin, but people who actually had the Holy Spirit dwelling in their lives. Yet this thing kept coming up among uh, these Jews and these Gentiles and in conversations. And the question was, did a person have to become a Jew before they could become a Christian? Did a person who didn't have a Jewish background have to go and do all the J Jewish customs before they could become a Christian? And Galatians is Paul's attempt to set the record straight and to lead the Jews from the God loves us most way of thinking. So this morning I want to invite you to the book of Galatians, to the first of what I call the little letters. And uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 11 through 21 specifically. When Cephas, and Cephas is the Greek name for Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, they used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back, 
and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. You kind of see, you see the, imagine if you would, we can, we can imagine a lunchroom cafeteria type situation and we got a group of Gentiles over here and we got a group of Jews over here or maybe actually no Jews at all. Let's just imagine it like this scenario. We got a whole, uh, we got a lunchroom scenario, or maybe for you it's a, it's a, it could be one of the restaurants in Farmville type scenario. And there are these people who are considered the outsiders. And then we have this guy, Peter, who's born and bred a Jew, who's one of the early uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, who, although he was consistently inconsistent after Jesus dies, he does his very best and becomes one of the, those Christians martyred for his faith. And when other Jews aren't around, he is best friends with the Gentiles, with those people who are outside of the group. But Paul here writes that it wasn't so when some of his Jewish friends showed back up. He says in verse 13, The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew. Yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus that we may not be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We see here that Peter is holding on to some things, isn't he? We hold on to things, don't we? We hold on to identities. We hold on to failures. We hold on to grudges. We hold on to plans and dreams and even systems, family dynamics, or belief in ritualistic religious systems. But Paul's response to Peter is to call him to let go of it, to call him out of what he's holding on to, because it's making him look bad. It's evident that he's being a hypocrite, and worse, he's distorting and even contorting the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the Jewish mindset that both Paul and Peter grew up in with, with is that we do things before God and that makes us holy. Paul reminds Peter, though, in verse 16, that we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works or what we do in front of the Lord, works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. You know, our salvation does not come by anything other than putting our trust fully in Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you receive salvation from Jesus Christ in any other way, please set an appointment for, to meet with me next week because I want to hear all about it. Because what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, is for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I love what Paul says in verses 19 through 21, which also happens to be, as many, many scholars write about Galatians, probably the hinge point or the key verses here in the book. He says it to this church in Galatia, to these Christians who have this identity crisis where they they, they, they kind of they think that to, to have full access to a relationship with God, they need to in some way go back and be circumcised and, and, and uphold 613 laws that Jesus summed up in, in just a couple of commands. They need to go back and do all of these other things and, and 
Paul is saying, no, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. He says, for through the law I die to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. What Paul's saying in saying I don't set it aside is he's saying that's exactly what I'll hold on to. He holds on to the grace of God. Let me ask you just to pause for a moment this morning and ask, I want to ask you, how, how are you doing with that? Are you holding on to the grace of God? I read this around about Friday of last week. And then I read it again on Saturday. And then I really needed it on Sunday. Because for me, to be on the sideline, so to speak, wrapped up in my girdle, sitting in the recliner, hoping that the swelling at some point was going to go down so I could, you know, put shoes on and that sort of thing. Thank, thank the Lord for hey dudes. I could just slide them. Hey dudes and Crocs got me through a couple weeks there already. Um, but I got, my, I got my leather boots on this morning. So there, there you go, just, just in case you want to see them. Um, I was starting to feel, man, I don't feel like I'm contributing to society or my family. Like, all I could do was, like, you know, with, with Luke and Levi, you know, just kind of say things from a distance. Gina had, had actually taken to a tournament up in, in Boone, and, and as you know how little boys are, and our boys are sweet little boys that got good hearts, but, man, you get them together, and they can cause a little bit of ruckus, you know, and I'm trying to encourage them on the phone. And uh, I just got this feeling like, gosh, I'm not contributing in any way. You know, as I was reading this, I was reminded that as a, as a believer in Christ, I'm to hold on to nothing else than grace. And it got me thinking about the ways that we as brothers and sisters in Christ and as followers of Jesus are called to display grace on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis to everyone we meet. You see, when we're holding on to, great, to the grace of God, there are a couple of things I want to talk about this morning that happened. The first thing is that we are displaying an accurate image to other people of who Jesus is. When we hold on to the grace of God and allow that to permeate in everything we do, we are actually then giving an accurate display of who Jesus is. I love how... In, in the Gospel of John, I didn't write this into my notes, so I'm going to skip there real quick. But John was a really good Jew. And, and you know, we have in the very beginning of, of the Bible, anybody remember the first few words in, in uh, Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so, and, and then he's in, in the beginning, we have this. Uh, and then let me, maybe pull on John. let me get to John real quick. I love how John, you know, John knew the scriptures. John knew Genesis. And so when he begins writing his gospel, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus has been and always has been and always will be. And, and we, we see, we see the, the building of this idea of, of, of the Trinity, which is still hard for many to wrap their, their minds around one God, being experienced in three ways and being in relationship with one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he, he talks so much about Jesus. And one of the most beautiful things he says about Jesus comes in, in John chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, where he says that out of his fullness, out of the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus. If you want to know how, how wrong you are and how, how much of a sinner you are, and it doesn't matter how close you, you draw to Jesus, we're always going to have this wrestling of the, the flesh and the spirit. The spirit. We see Paul talk about that in, in, elsewhere in Galatians and in other pieces of the scripture. We see people who love Jesus and are sold out for Jesus, and it's easy to make a mistake, but we're not called to live our lives focused on the mistakes that we make, but focused on following Jesus and living lives of grace. Think about the lies that people hear often regarding Jesus and relationship. They're not good enough. Well, the truth is, there's no one good enough, right? We're all fallen. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. 
Or how about I have to clean myself up before I can come to the Lord? You ever heard that one before? You ever, you ever talk to somebody about Jesus and go, well, I need, there's some things in my life I need to straighten out before I can go to church. It's Jesus who makes you clean. You scrub, scrub, scrub all you want. But if you don't come to the Lord, you won't be clean. Or you go through hardships, and I hear this one quite often. I talk to people who go through hardships, and they say, God is punishing me in some way. Well, the truth is that everyone goes through suffering. Everyone goes through trials. It doesn't mean that God is punishing us. You see, when we show people grace, when we're holding on to the grace of God and giving people grace, we are giving an, actu- an, a, an accurate image, act- an accurate view of who Jesus is. The second thing, and this will be the last thing for those who are wondering how many points we might have today. When we're holding on to the grace of God, we are standing in a place of power. When we think about standing in a place of power, often we think about accomplishments. We think about accolades. We think about possessions. We think about a, a, a place of prominence that we might hold within an organization. But that's not what we see about what power is from the scriptures. I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, where, uh, where Paul talks about some struggles that he experienced. I mean, here's a man who, who, who went through some stuff before he met Jesus. I mean, I mean think, think of how wretched his soul must have been feeling as he was going around persecuting Christians, seeing to it that those who didn't recant of, of their following of Jesus were executed, and thinking maybe the next one might satisfy this zeal I have for the Lord. Imagine how miserable he really was deep in his soul when he met Jesus. And he wasn't a person who thought that sin would all of a sudden be gone forever. He was a person who knew that following Jesus didn't mean mean that he wouldn't struggle. That there wouldn't be times that he fell. He knew that it would be a life of, of, of battling the flesh and the spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, whether we can debate all day long about whether that just came upon him and what that thorn was and who gave it to him and, 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 and whatever, but the truth remains, we all have a thorn in our flesh, don't we? Don't we? There's not a person in here, not a person joining this online who doesn't have something in their lives that they would love to take away, that they would love for God to remove from them, and then I might have the strength of the Lord. But Paul says in verse nine, he said, oh, in verse eight, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away, take it away from me, take this thorn of the flesh away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. If you have a thorn in the flesh this morning, if you have a place where, oh, you you know that you want to be strong in the Lord, but you say, I'm so weak there. Let me encourage you this morning to give it to the Lord. Don't just ask him to take it away, but give it to him. Seek him through it. Confess your sin. Confess your shortcomings. Draw close to the Lord. You will find that his grace is sufficient for you and that his power is made perfect in your weakness. Power comes from Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 we see Jesus ascending into heaven. And one of the last words he says to his apostles is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And for them it took 40 days. Thank God for us it doesn't take 40 days when we confess faith in Jesus. When we confess faith in Jesus, when we trust him with our life, when we say, God, I know who, who, who you are. I trust that Jesus is the son of God and that his death um, has paid the penalty for my sin. And I trust my life to him. Immediately, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in the heart of the believer, in the soul of you and me. You have power. You're much more powerful. You're much more powerful than you might believe you are. And holding on to grace is the only way, holding on to grace is the only way that we might activate the power of God in our lives. 
So let me, you, you might say, well, what, what does it look like to be a person who holds on to the grace of God? I understand that I need to do it. I understand that that's a path to power. I understand that that's the way to display to other people Jesus. Well, let me ask you this morning, do you know him? Because the first step is to receive Jesus. You know, I was, I was, I was going to have a little children's sermon this morning. And then Holly came and I said, Holly, I need some help because they were going to have a children's uh, retreat this weekend. And then our kids were sick. And so, again, we're kind of under, still under the weather at the home. Gina, hope everything's going good there. The kids being wild out, being under the weather. But anyway, my, my, my little, my thing was going to, I don't have my wallet on me. I wish I did. Um, but because uh, I just happen to have a $100 bill in my wallet right now. I never have a $100 bill in my wallet, but I sold a pigeon to a friend yesterday. We met out on, we did a, a deal on the, uh, was it the uh, Stantonsburg exit and uh, sold a pigeon to my friend Skip. So I, have, I happen to have a $100 bill in my wallet right now. But I was going to take the $100 bill out and I was going to say, you know, now if I said you can have this $100 bill and this is a gift to you, would you take it? And, and the, the natural answer should be yes, I'll, I'll take it. That is a good gift. That is a gift that, that helps me immensely. And then the question, I was, you know, I was going to talk a little bit around that and say, you know, that's, that's, that's what grace is. The, the gift of salvation that God gives us is a grace gift. It's something that we haven't worked for. You know, the children haven't worked for that money. And I, obviously, I, you know, I don't know if I was actually going to give it to them unless I gave it to one of my kids and then got it back from them later. You know, so that's a whole other story to it because uh, I'm just apparently not as good as Jesus. But, um, but, but, but you know, think, think about the analogy. you got a $100 bill. You're offering it to somebody, giving it as a gift, something that they haven't earned, that is freely for them to take, yet it cost me something, didn't it? It cost me, it cost me the time and the energy of raising that bird and then having the conversations and, and everything that goes around with that. You know, when we work for money, we, we've, we've given something in exchange for that, our time and our effort and such. God gave in giving his one and only son. It cost him so that we might have that grace gift, didn't it? So if you're here this morning, or if you're joining us online, and you haven't accepted that gift, let me encourage you to do so. That is the best gift that you can ever, ever accept and give to yourself. And if you've been a Christian for a while, and you know there's, there's more to experience than maybe you're experiencing right now, let me encourage you to continue trusting and following and obeying the Holy Spirit in your life. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says, If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. I mean, when your child has a birthday, you give them a decent gift, right? Right? Yeah, we give good gifts, right? And so Jesus is telling these people, look, y'all, even though you're evil, you give good gifts. Well, then he goes on and, and he says, uh, How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is one of God's greatest gifts to us after salvation. It's his very presence dwelling in us. And, and, and later in this book of Galatians, Paul says that we need to be people who live life in step with the Spirit. He says in Galatians 5, 22 through 25, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says against, there, against those things there is no law. You steal, you kill, you destroy, there's laws against that. But it, Doing these things that are fruit of the Spirit, there's no law against it. You can do it as much as you want, and it blesses you, and it blesses other people. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. And since then, we live by the Spirit. We will keep in step with the Spirit. So, uh, Allison's going to come now, and she's going to lead us in our uh, hymn of response this morning, which is called The Solid Rock. And I want to give encouragement to you this morning. I'll be down here to receive you if, if you want to respond in any way. Perhaps you're coming this morning and have been coming for a while, and maybe today is the day you want to become a member of the church. Or perhaps you haven't been baptized and you seek to do that. Or maybe you haven't made a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you don't know how to begin a relationship with Jesus. In whatever way you might come this morning, I'll be here to receive you in the name of Christ. Again, uh, we, I invite you now to stand to sing the Solid Rock, hymn number 5.
26. <laughs> So following the benediction, we will have uh, the postlude briefly, um, and then after that we will have a called business meeting. So if you are, are not a member of the church and need to slide out, that is a chance for you to do so. But please do stay uh, if, if you are a member of the church so we can hear a report update from our search committee uh, for the minister with youth community and virtual ministry. So uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the day and the, the many ways that you have uh, blessed us with your Holy Spirit and with grace and the ways that we're, we're called to hold on to that grace. Lord, I pray that we will each take, uh, take time in the days ahead to consider uh, what we hold on to, and it, whether it's life-giving or, or life-taking. And we pray that we will be people who give um, and give abundantly to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs>